This is the second half of chapter five. The last sentence we read was, Taubes has all but demolished the whole lipid hypothesis, demonstrating just how little scientific backing it had from the very beginning. Indeed, wind the tape back to 1976 and you'll find plenty of reasons to doubt the lipid hypothesis even then. Some of these reasons were circumstantial, but nevertheless compelling. For instance, during the decades of the 20th century when rates of heart disease were rising in America, Americans were actually reducing their intake of animal fats in the form of lard and tallow. In place of those fats, they consumed substantially more vegetable oils, especially in the form of margarine, sales of which outpaced butter for the first time in 1957. Between the end of World War II and 1976, the year of McGovern's heart hearings, per capita consumption of animal fats from all sources dropped from 84 pounds to 71, while fats from seed oils approximately doubled. Americans appeared to be moving in the direction of a prudent diet, and yet, paradoxically, having more heart attacks on it, not fewer. As for the precipitous decline in heart disease during the years of World War II, that could just as easily be attributed to factors other than the scarcity of meat, butter, and eggs. Not just animal protein, but sugar and gasoline were also strictly rationed during the war. Americans generally ate less of everything, including, notably, refined carbohydrates. They did, however, eat more fish and got more exercise because they couldn't drive as freely thanks to gas rationing. But the lipid hypothesis would not be deterred. Researchers in the 1950s and 1960s had studied populations in other countries that had substantially lower rates of heart disease, which could be explained by their lower consumption of saturated fat. That it could just as easily be explained by other factors, fewer total calories, fewer refined carbohydrates, more exercise, more fruits and vegetables or fish, did not disturb the gathering consensus that fat must be the key. The consensus hinged on two suggestive links that were well established by the early 60s, a link between high rates of cholesterol in the blood and the likelihood of heart disease, and a link between saturated fat in the diet and cholesterol levels in the blood. Both these links have held up, but it doesn't necessarily follow from them that consumption of saturated fat leads to heart disease, unless you can also demonstrate that serum cholesterol is a cause of heart disease and not, say, just a symptom of it. And though evidence for a link between cholesterol in the diet and cholesterol in the blood has always been tenuous, the belief that the former contributed to the latter has persisted, perhaps because it makes such intuitive sense, and perhaps because it has been so heavily promoted by the margarine makers. Despite these gaps, it seems a short, easy step for McGovern's committee to link the links, as it were, and conclude that eating meat and dairy, as important sources of both saturated fat and cholesterol, contributed to heart disease. After all, the American Heart Association has already taken the same short link-linking step and has been advocating a prudent diet in low fat and cholesterol since 1961. Still, the committee was not unaware of the controversy surrounding the research on which it was basing its recommendations. It had received a strongly worded letter of dissent from the American Medical Association, urging that, quote, there is a potential for harmful effects through a radical long-term dietary change as would occur through adoption of the proposed national goal. Still, the national goal was adopted. Never before had the government endeavored to change the diet of the whole population. In the past, nutritional policies had targeted particular populations at risk for particular deficiencies. But as Tobes has documented, the attitude on the committee was that even if all the data weren't quite as rock hard yet, what would be the harm in getting Americans to cut down on dietary fats? At the press conference introducing the dietary goals, Mark Hegstead, the Harvard School of Public Health nutritionist who helped to shape them, put it this way. The question to be asked is not why we should change our diet, but why not? At least one good answer to that question was apparently overlooked. Perhaps because fat was in such a bad repute in 1977, Dr. Hegg said and his colleagues must not have stopped to consider how a change in the levels or ratios of the various lipids and the promotion of a biologically novel fat like trans fats might affect human physiology. It bears remembering that the human brain is about 60% fat. Every neuron is sheathed in a protective layer of the stuff. Fats make up the structure of our cell walls, the ratios between the various kinds influencing the permeability of the cells to everything from glucose and hormones to microbes and toxins. Without adequate amounts of fat in the diet, fat-soluble vitamins like A and E can't pass through the intestinal walls. All this was known in 1977, but the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, evidently does not apply to official dietary advice, which at least in 1977 followed a very different principle. Why not? So potentially much was at stake for our health and well-being when the government threw its weight behind a wholesale change in the American diet. True, it was entirely possible that the nation would have chosen simply to ignore the dietary goals and go on eating as it had, but that's not what happened. Instead, the goals were taken seriously, and one of the more ambitious nutritional experiments in our history got underway. 
Authority over the national menu, which in the past had rested largely with tradition and habit and mom, shifted perceptibly in January 1977. Culture ceded a large measure of its influence over how we ate and thought about eating to science, or what passes for science in dietary matters, nutritionism would be a more accurate term. Premature or not, the New York Times' as Jane Brody wrote in 1981, the dietary goals are beginning to reshape the nutritional philosophy, if not yet the eating habits, of most Americans.